Sounds good. Hello, everyone. Welcome to ISMA 2021 display session. My name is Evan Peng from Stanford University. As the very first session of this amazing event, we do have five amazing presentations today. I'm sure you will enjoy the talks. So while we are waiting for other participants to join and before kicking off our talks, I would like to mention a few notes. So this year, ISMA, we have provided multiple channels and social media platforms where you can share your experience with other attendees. Feel free to post your thoughts or comments. Also remember to tag ISMA21. We appreciate that. In addition, there are individual Discord channels for the session, as well as each paper for discussion with authors during the week and beyond. So feel free to drop by to say hi anytime. YouTube stream is also available for you to register to join the interactive elements of ISMA 2021. So after the session, we encourage you to move into the gala town to talk with authors in Q&A rooms. All these links are provided in this card and on our web pages. The last one, feel free to post questions during the live talks using Zoom's Q&A feature and in the channels. We will be monitoring the posts and collect them here. I'm sure all speakers are more than happy to answer your questions. Okay, let's start. So the first paper is entitled Edge Guided Near Eye Image Analysis for Head Multi Displays. The authors are Zhi Ming Wang, Yu Xin Zhao, Yun Fei Liu, Feng Lu. The speaker is Zhi Ming Wang from Beihang University. Let's welcome. Jimmy, I think you can share the screen. It's all the stage is yours. Hello? Sorry, we can't hear you. Do you want to check your audio setting? Hello? Hello, Jimin. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, I will share my uh, slides. Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jimmy Wang, uh, a PhD student from Beihan University. Uh, the paper I will be um, presenting today is titled Edge Guided Near Eye Image Analysis for uh, Head Mounted uh, Displays. Yeah, uh, these are authors of this work. My talk will be in five parts. Firstly, I'll be speaking about the background of near eye tracking. Uh, recently, eye tracking has been used in many applications. It can be applied to forward-edged rendering, redirected working, gaze-based interaction, and behavior analysis. Researchers have made efforts to develop robust near-eye tracking techniques. Uh, these methods need to compute gaze-relative features, such as pupil center, pupil ellipse and errors ellipse from infrared eye images. Some of them search the features based on the morphological processing will CNN-based methods directly regress pupil centers or perform image semantic segmentation. For example, Deep VOG used the UNET to segment out the pupil area and then fit an ellipse on it. 
LSAC segments or to complete pupil and error structures and showed its effectiveness when dealing with partially occluded pupil or iris contours. We observe that most discriminate information in the eye image is encoded in certain age areas, including two eyelids and pupil contour and iris contour. Uh, we call it uh, task-related ages. Uh, such age ages are highly related to the high-level semantic tasks. We propose a novel near eye image analysis method which, with age maps as guidance. Uh, specifically, we first utilize an age extraction network to predict high-quality age maps, uh, which only contain eyelids and errors or pupil contours with other, with, without other undesired uh, ages. Then we fit the edge maps into an uh, edge guided segmentation and fitting network for accurate segmentation and uh, ellipse fitting. <clears throat> uh, I will introduce the pipeline of our work. To acquire sufficient realistic training images, we further propose the image intensity transfer approach for generating realistic images from synthetic images. The age extraction network is optimized with adversarial learning to produce high quality edge maps. We then propose an edge guided segmentation and fitting network. Uh, both eye images and the generated uh, edge maps are fed into the network to perform multitask learning. Uh, the network uh, <coughs> respectively generates the eye segmentation and the regress the, uh, regresses the ellipse uh, parameters or pupil and the errors. Uh, in addition, we notice the regress the parameters usually uh, are inaccurate. Uh, we also propose the adaptive search, uh, search model to search the optimal ellipse um, parameters with the guidance of the segmentation maps. Uh, next, I will introduce the details of our work. There are two challenges in the task related uh, ages. Uh, in the uh, age extraction, uh, first, to eliminate task unrelated ages. <clears throat> Uh, the image, images show the results of age extraction utilizing the canny detection. Uh, many undesired uh, ages, ages, such as eye, uh, eyelashes, glasses, and glands are extracted. Uh, second, to complete the task related ages. For example, the lambas is blurry due to the ambient infrared illumination. This causes the task-related age lost. Uh, E2Net contains an age uh, generator and a discriminator. We optimize the generator by minimizing the combination of cross-atrophy loss and uh, adversarial loss. The discriminator network aims to correctly distinguish inputs. Uh, please consult our paper for more details. Uh, we use sufficient uh, synthetic images for training the E2Net. However, there is a large difference between the real and the synthetic images. Uh, to solve this problem, we propose the I2T method for producing realistic images from synthetic images. We use the dimensionality reduction to visualize the synthetic and the uh, real images in 2D space before and after I2T. The comparison also shows that I2T shortens the gap between synthetic and uh, real images. Uh, firstly, we sample 10,000 images from four real near eye data sites. Secondly, given a real image, we divided it into three subregions 
which respectively contain errors and singular uh, skin and pupil. Uh, then we calculate the intensity histogram of each subregion. Thirdly, we fit three mixture gassing distributions, which corresponds to the distributions of three subregion histograms. Uh, firstly, we employ the histogram matching algorithm and perform a mapping that transforms intensities of the source image towards, uh, towards the target. The image shows the procedure of ally image intensity. Uh, ESFNet utilizing the edge maps to get the eye segmentation and the ellipse parameter fitting indeed the encoder, decoder, and the regression model can be arbitrary. In this paper, we employ the dense, uh, dense IONET as the backbone uh, to layer MLP for regression model similar to your, uh, your SAG. Yeah. <clears throat> we found the regressed parameters usually are inaccurate. Uh, to this uh, to this end, we propose ASM to search the optimal ellipse on the guidance of the segmentation maps. The 13th goal is the, to uh, maximizing the value of IOU uh, between the segmentation map and the, and the ellipse formed by parameters. <clears throat> In this work, we employ the synthetic I data set and our train data set. We evaluate our work on four publicly real data sets NV gates, AR, uh, Open EDS, LPW, and four. Um, we compare our approach with state of the art methods, including um, Deep VOG, Red Knight, and uh, YOSEG. Um, Concretative uh, comparison results are shown in the table. Yeah, in, in average, our methods surpass the second best method by 4% and the 9% in pupil and errors ellipse uh, fitting accuracy respectively. Um, our E and our E and I achieve generally sim similar uh, average results. This uh, demonstrates the uh, advantage of using our extracted high quality edges in segmentation and ellipse fitting uh, even without using the original image as input. Uh, visual examples are shown in the image. Under the guidance of the task related uh, age, our model is more interested in boundary region that smooths the contours of semantic uh, or segmentation map and uh, uh, segments more accurate uh, ellipse sh shape. <coughs> shape. Uh, besides, our method is rarely affected by disturbance. Uh, it, the reflections on the uh, glasses. To demonstrate the, demonstrate the usability of our method, we assessed the, the EOSEC and the ESF net in the customized AR device. We also implement, uh, implemented the 2D uh, gaze estimation task in the AR device, achieving 0 0.38 degree accuracy. Uh, this video shows the visual comparison uh, between your stack and ours, um, which demonstrates the advantage of using such high quality edge maps in eye image segmentation and uh, your uh, ellipse fitting. <clears throat> Currently, we collected the data by using our device and assessed the, the networks offline. In the future, we will conduct more online tests with the AR device in real time. Besides, we can uh, use the knowledge dis distillation to optimize our network for energy efficient application. We will fit 3D I model based on a set of I features, um, which can multi uh, re reduce the effect of uh, device slippage and improve the stability or gates estimation. Uh, code and model at this URL.
Uh, thanks for your time and the interest in our work. Thank you, Jimin, Thank you. for the nice presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, time Thank for you. questions. Just a reminder, yeah. feel free to type your questions using Zoom Q&A features. Um, let me see. So while we are waiting for questions, I could start with one. So I think eye tracking techniques are kind of like state of art technology already, right? So many existing headsets, like for example, HoloLens, or many other big guys products, they already support pretty nice case estimation. So could you share a bit more about what aspects do you think your deep learning method distinguish and could be beneficial in terms of detecting the eye features compared to existing like, headsets? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, the current eye uh, tracking techniques uh, applied in indoor scenarios uh, however, when we want to use the device in an uh, outdoor condition, the ambient inf infrared illumination uh, will increase the difficulty of eye detection. Uh, besides, the eyelashes and the reflections on the glasses are also uh, of, uh, affect the performance of eye detection. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, Using the deep learning to uh, to detect uh, to detect eye features is very, uh, very useful. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Maybe I have another um, source of comments. So this was implemented for case estimation in AR devices. So any other applications in your mind that we could be using these kind of like solutions, like for example, using eye features? Yeah, uh, thank you. You know, uh, uh, apart from the eye gates, um, pupil or area segmentation can support more applications. Uh, for, for instance, uh, area segmentation can help uh, HoloLens tool to log in AR system uh, using area recognition, yeah. Um, pupil detection was used for visual fatigue assessment. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thank let's you. see. Okay. Um, we have limited time. So if any of you guys have any questions, feel free to join us in the post session event. I think Jimmy will be there to answer questions. Yeah, okay. Let's you. move to the next paper. Thank you, Jimmy. Very nice work. Thank you. Yeah, just a reminder for those who joined a bit late, if you have any questions, feel free to type in in the Zoom Q&A feature. Also, if you want to ask your questions in person, feel free to raise your hands. Okay, let's move to the next paper. So the next paper would be head mounted display with increased downward field of view, improves presence and sense of self -loca -loca location. The authors are Kizashi Nakano, Nayo Isoyama, Diego Motoro, Nobuchika Sakada, Kyoshi Kyokawa, and Takuji Nanumi. The speaker would be Kizashi. Let's welcome. Okay, let's start. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Today, I'm going to talk about HMG with increased amount of field of view, input presence, and safe, uh, sense of safe location. Okay, hi, I'm Kizashi. And I'm a PhD student in Japan. This is also a paper of the paper. This presentation is online, but we are looking for the interacting offline in the future. Also, I will, I will want to meet and eat, eat Italian pizza, cheese, and pasta. Now, let me turn to my presentation. HMGs provide various experience and perceptual effects through a visual presentation with a larger field of view. However, the virtual view angle of current HMGs has been emphasized. The primary purpose of this presentation is just to show you the importance of the vertical downward field of view. I refer to simply as a downward FOV. An example where uh, this downward FOV is essential is using uh, full body humanoid avatars. And using uh, full, body, uh, full body humanoid avatar is essential for presenting a high presence in the virtual environment. And this fear is in uh, scanned my body. 
And the instigator or evaluating is, is a sense of animal event, which consists of three, these uh, three indicators. Uh, various studies have to be done to increase these senses. And it is known that a high SOE can be obtained by using a human avatar. Previous studies, previous studies has, uh, has shown that the visibility of human avatars is essential for SOE. In particular, it is known that SOE can be obtained by showing hand torso connectivity and foot animation. On the other hand, the downward FOV is uh, of existing HMD is limited. The, downward, uh, the downward, uh, downward FOV is essential in order to see the user's own body. Without using a virtual mirror, it is difficult to see user's own body, and it is it's possible to see the junction of the hand and torso or the feet. Therefore, we have developed an HMG with a new frame lens and LCD added to the lower part of the existing HMG to increase the downward field of view. The image on the right is what the user will see when using the HMG we developed. The upper part is the image part of the existing HMG, and the lower part is the increased image part. And they can see the body of the human avatar. And uh, this slide is a schematic diagram of the HMG we created. Cut off the bottom half on the HC pipe and added the frenal lens and HD using the housing. I measured the FOV by an equidistant projection fisheye camera. The vertical field of view of the HMG we, uh, we pro uh, produced uh, was about 130 degrees. Of this, uh, the downward FOV is, uh, is about 90 degrees. The human national downward FOV is about 80 degrees, and this exceeds it. Next, I will, do, I will briefly describe the hardware design. The frame lens and LCD press uh, at the 20 degrees to the eye. Also, I, also the IPD is set to about 70 millimeters. Then the distance between the vibe eyepiece and the user's eye, user's eye was set to 30 millimeters using the VIVE's uh, adjustment function to install the optical unit. Next, I will discuss software design. I use Unity and SimVR for software production. And two virtual cameras have been added on the, on the, the left and the right eyes to follow the movement of the virtual camera using, uh, used in SimVR. As, uh, as shown on the right, I use I used Unity Future to edit the view custom of the virtual camera. I then manually fix the position and location of the virtual camera. Next, I will explain the experiment one. Participants uh, perform the task in which they trace a line from the starting point to the goal. First, they move their bodies and in front of the virtual mirror for 30 seconds while viewing the, their bodies. Next, they painted a virtual cat in a squatting position. This movement was done to get used to present uh, the uh, image, uh, present the image in the downward FOV. After that, they were instruct instructed to, the, to trace the purple line with the center of their body to the goal point. And the avatar was tra uh, tracked at the four point with uh, final IK. The experiment one followed a two times two factor design. The independent variables uh, was a uh, presence or absence for downward FOV and the type of avatar. The avatars were either full body human avatars or sphere avatars with only hands. I also changed the appearance of the human avatar according to the gender of the participants. In the experiment one, I conducted a within participant experiment. The total number of the participants in the experiment was 24. I asked about IPQ to measure presence, and IBV to measure SOA and SOVO, and SSQ to measure symmetric thickness. I also measured the elapsed time from start to finish and the uh, speech angle of the head. In addition, I measured the percentage of the time the avatar traces the line to measure SOSL. Next. Uh, the result of the experiment, experiment one. I will present the most exciting result. This uh, graph shows the percentage of the time the avatar uh, twice the line. This result shows uh, show a 
high score in the on edge condition, which is the condition where the human avatar is used and the downward FOV is increased. In other words, it, turn out, it, it turns out that uh, SOA SL can be improved by two factors. First, uh, increased visibility by increasing the downward FOV. Second, making it clear where user is standing by displaying the human avatar. And this slide is a summary of the result of experiment one. Look at the area surrounded by the orange line. It turns out that increasing the downward FOV improves the SOSL. However, that's not a fair present SOA and SOVO. In experiment one, I thought it was due to the lack of body movement. Therefore, I did experiment two with more, with more body movement. In experiment two, participants were tasked with moving from the second floor to the first floor. First, they looked at their own bodies in the virtual mirror for 30 seconds. They were then free to observe the surrounding objects for 30 seconds. A large fire and a butter cat are set up, set up around. And doors have been installed at multiple locations throughout the course. If they touch the door with their hands, for a certain period of time, the door will disappear and they just pass through. I installed a small fire to press the feet. And I installed the deciding staircase. Also, I measured the pitch. I, uh, I measure that changing the pitch angle of the head. Next, I will explain the experiment two. Participants and the questionnaire was, uh, was the same as in experiment one. Also, I measure the total time of the task and the pitch angle of the head at specific location. For example, I measure the area A with a fire at the feet and the area B, B uh, with a downward, downward staircase. They perform the task in two different conditions with a without lower vision while using a human avatar. Okay. I represent the critical result of experiment two. This graph shows the results for presence as measured by the IPQ questionnaire. Notice the graph surrounded by the box. The results show that on rates are significantly higher in the item of experienced realism and the total presence. In short, downward field of view improves presence and the sense of realism. Next, I will discuss the result for the pitch angle of the head. The graph, uh, graph on the right shows that average head pitch angle in area A. The, uh, the, uh, the results of the graph show that the head angle turns upward in the on edge condition with an uh, increase in the downward FOV. In short, uh, as the downward field of view increases, the participants were able to see the small fire at their feet without moving their heads. The following result is for the disaking staircase in area B. And the graph on the right is a histogram of the frequency of occurrence of the head pitch angles for each participant and ranked by five degrees. In the on edge condition and off edge condition, the top of the histogram are around 30 degrees. On the other hand, on edge is bimodal, and the top of the histogram can be seen at the, around 10 degrees. In short, increased downward field of view may improve the visibility of deciding staircase. Finally, I will give a summary of the results. I found that increased downward field of view is effective in improving presence and sense of SOSL. Also, this was no tendency to increase symmetry thickness. Furthermore, I found that the head to angle was turned upward. This is also that the increasing, increased downward field of view has a positive effect on the virtual experience, but limited effect on SOA and SOVO. 
I think this is because the tracking system for the upper arms, shoulders, and leg visible in the downward field of view is not sufficient. In addition, I need to experiment with eye trackers to investigate how often users look at their bodies. Although many issues remain to be resolved, I believe that presenting information to the downward field of view will become an essential topic in the future. I hope that many researchers and developers will follow this research theme. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kisashi. Very nice presentation. Yeah, so again, question time. So feel free to post your questions using the Zoom Q&A features or in the channel or just raise your hands. So let me see. Um, okay, we do have one question in the chat. Let me check. Okay, so Joe was asking, from your research and experiences, what types of user tasks are the most likely to really benefit from the downward field of view? Hmm, so, so, so maybe so tracing and uh, tracing task is so very so good uh, effect. Um, this, so users so tracing? can see, okay. users can see uh, their bodies and so uh, texture on the, uh, a uh, field, field. So I think we need to so combine uh, our uh, bodies and virtual environment uh, texture. That's all. Okay, thank you so much. Um, do you have any other questions? I also do have a question. So I think this is a great add-on of this kind of a downward display unit. But I also noticed that there's a gap between the two display units, right? So I'm curious mm -hmm. about during your user study, any feedback or comments from the users and whether this gap will affect the user experience. Any thoughts in terms of how to mitigate this? So uh, the system how we have developed uh, has a horizontal uh, gap about 10 degrees. So it is possible that is inhibiting the connectivity on the virtual body, uh, making the detected uh, lens will represent the FOV from detecting uh, in the future. Also, I believe that the user feels the gap like the frame of the uh, part of the part of glasses. And further, I can tell the user didn't seem to be affected by gap. Okay, sounds good. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's send the speaker again. Also, if you have further questions or if you want to say hi to the speaker, please come to join us in the post session event. Thank you so much. Let's move to the next paper. So the next paper would be blending shadows, casting shadows in virtual and real using occlusion capable augmented reality near eye displays. The authors are Kyosato Someya, Uta Ito. Uh, the speaker will be Uta. Welcome. Hello, Uta. Uh, there might be some technical issues. My apologies, I had some Zoom connection issues. So I'll be sharing my screen now. Sure, go ahead. Okay, thank so you. Should be working, right? Okay, so yeah. hello guys. My name is Yutaito from the University of Tokyo, Japan. So this is a joint work with my student, Kiyosat Somaya and myself. And we will talk about the work called Blending Shadow casting shadows in virtual and real using occlusion capable augmented real near displays. So what we want to do is about how to solve this kind of, you know, uh, visualization issue in see-through AR, right? And then we want to have this kind of mutual soft shadow between the virtual 
and optically see through real world. Okay, so the visual realism in optical see through AR is actually kind of high thing these days, like one from Sigur Fiesia this year. So how realistically, how much you can pursue the realism, visual realism in see through AR virtual context is quite interesting. And there are a bunch of issues like accommodation color, dynamic range, and we, especially this work features on opaqueness of those problems, right? So if you wear a like HoloLens, then you typically have this kind of see-through virtual objects. And then traditional, conventional method to, com to, to resolve this kind of issues, of course, like uh, very famous work from Kiyoshi, like this introducing opaque see-through layer, which can selectively cut light from the real world. But the one missing issue, which is kind of obvious in computer graphics, but not in see-through AR, is to implement this kind of mutual soft shadow. So, you know, the real world object should cast a shadow in, onto the virtual object, right? And the virtual shadow should ideally also cast shadow onto real object, vice versa, or you have combination of two by two, so for different conditions. And then there are actually some works having yeah, I've been tackling in this issue. Like uh, this work is like shadow induction, so which actually use some visual illusion. So instead of occluding in implicitly, occlu explicitly occlude light from the real world, you actually just copy the scene. Like it's a half video sister setup where you just emphasize the scene of the background and then you just cause a visual illusion of shadow effect. But instead, our main contributions are the following. It's like we want to have optically consistent, which means the shadows, the mutual shadow we realize is actually optically correct. And, and we also conducted some quantitative comparison with some uh, with very focal occlusion capable display, benchtop system, sorry, it's missing. And also we found, a, <laughs> of course, tons of problems. It's nothing perfect, never be perfect. Right, it's research. So we want to just share, hey, we have these more problems we find. So please follow us. So this is kind of main message from us. And let's say the let's talk the, the detail briefly. Maybe you can refer to the paper for the more detail. But the, the idea is quite simple, but it's not actually kind of simple to realize. So we want to have a virtual contest, the, the famous Stanford Benny. And then what we want to have is not only shadow complete like opaque mask which block the light behind the virtual object but you also want to kind of simulate these soft shadow which should be rendered in the real scene and then everything is correctly computed and then augmented and then combined then you get the right augmented scene the problem of this is i mean then so the the pipeline is actually kind of straightforward but you have to be careful for what to take into account like uh, we don't go into the detail, but the optical depths of the mask or object scene, or even the eye focus matter the shape of the virtual mutual soft shadow. So these actually parameters has to be properly calibrated and also measured beforehand. So that therefore our system is still offline, but we just analyze what would be necessary and then sorted out those parameters. And then for the actual hardware, we wanted to have a proof of concept system. And it turns out to be better to have a very focal occlusion capable display, which can also shift the depths, the accommodation depths of the virtual shadow mask, which should be aligning with the virtual 3D object, which is kind of lying at a certain distance, not like just fixed focus distance, because then it, it causes some blurred shadow masks. So we integrated these components nicely. And then also, in addition, we measured the scene carefully. So that means the scene lighting and the 3D structure of the scene. And for experiment, towards experiments, we set up this kind of like a, a lab setup. We have some control lighting and also control position of the lightings and also pre-calibrated pre 3D scene of the geometry. And then everything is measured beforehand. And then we went to, and then we put, we just pushed this information into our rendering pipeline. So then for photorealistic lender, so if you want to have a mutual shadow, you need a photorealistic lender. And this is a quite common approach in, especially in computer graphics. So we just, we light on that platform. So therefore we took, a, we 
our approach we just based on the image based lighting which can create a nice soft shadow given the panoramic image of the scene and then combining those real geometry and the lighting so they are rendered in the simulation in blender and then that a, a little tricky part is then you have to actually then bake the virtual object of course that's easy and occlusion image which properly integrates this shadow information and then both information are sent uh, are sent to the display so we use a razor projector so that we can have a sharp image in virtual space regardless of the focus and then the transmissive lcd for the shadow mask respectively okay so that's uh, our setup and then let's look at the result that we some some results we had so we took one example scene to easily explain the things so the left column is what you what you want to have so we 3d printed even the real object of the same size and then this is kind of ground truth image that we would like to have in the in, in ideal scenario. And then on the right columns, so we show already the summarizes the results. So the, the yellow column is the left column is the final result. So which actually maybe the shadow is slightly larger than expected, but it's kind of nicely uh, realizing this virtual soft shadow in see-through AR. This is not video see-through. It's taken from the viewpoint by a camera, but it's, it's completely implemented on the see-through AR display. And the traditional AR display on the right column, of course, you have just transfer an object. And even if you just have occlusion mask, it's still like, you know, not nicely integrated in the real scene, right? And then for giving some, some hint of the objective measurement, so we employ the perceptual learning metrics, which can kind of visually assess the similarity between the Two between two images. And then we, our results show that, that this implementing shadow is apparently better than those other implementations. Please uh, go for the detail. Uh, please read the paper for the detail. But let's see the qualitative one. So we pre rendered everything and then displayed everything and then just created a batch video so that we can get the, the visual performance or impact of realizing those mutual shadows. So let's play the video. Okay, good. So without the scene, so you see these shadows are kind of casted virtually and you can perceive a virtual box there. And this is traditional AR scene without any occlusions. And this is with occlusion mask only, but you can still see the black object as if the black object is there. And then final result, you have a nice like virtual bunny presented in the world. And some feature part, okay, it's not included, but the, uh, we can say that this, so this is just a visual comparison with the three bunnies. So you can, it's a bit hard to see, but like on the ground, you have virtual shadow is rendered and the small bunny is actually casted by this real orange cube. Oh, I didn't mention that orange cube is real and the bunnies are all those virtual. And then you see these kind of mutual bi-directional shadows are casted between virtual and real property. And we found out a bunch of limitations from this experiment. Um, yeah, I just go through briefly, but lighting is in the wild, it's quite complex, right? And we had a, just like a prepared some studio light, but the real world, you need different, you need a nice lighting estimation. And eye measurement is also ignored in this case, because ideally you have to get the size of the pupil but fortunately, eye tracking is getting more commodity in, in these days. So I think this is never be limiting our applications. And the more important part is like this fine registration of between different layers. And these has to be kind of tracked or calibrated carefully. Otherwise the shadow mask and the virtual contents will be kind of misaligned each other. Okay, maybe I still have one more two minutes. So maybe I still explain this. Like offline trade, offline rendering is also another problem for any wearable AR display. So you have to maybe have some remote machine which send you the information. So this kind of like system would be necessary. And the actually this is not problem of the shadow rendering, but it's like a problem of current existing occlusion capable displays, especially using LCDs. They have this tiny dots kind of artifact, which also degrades the see-through view. 
Okay, and the system is buggy, but uh, we hope that we, we were able to deliver the concept and then, then convince people that this kind of realism is really nice time. So in the future, we want to have in a real system. Okay, so the summary, the blending shadow. So we presented optically consistent mutual shadows for C3 AR. And so which cast shadows among uh, or between the virtual and real object, and which is definitely improved the realism of the, the rendered scene. But we of course didn't have any kind of subjective studies and which might be very interesting if there are some people who want to corroborate with us for some perceptual study with these shadows. We are more than welcome to talk to you guys and during the conference. Okay, thank you for listening and any questions? Thank you, Rita. Very nice presentation, I would have to say. I mean, I think this is really nice work incorporating both optics and computer graphics. Reminds me of the moments with like rendering. Very good. Okay, question Tom. Feel free to type your questions in the uh, Q&A features or just raise your hands. While we are waiting for the attendees to type questions, I do have a question. So sure. you mentioned a bit about um, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yep. Cool. So you mentioned several limitations, but I think one of the issues for existing like optical see-through displays would be the limited color fidelity. So I'm curious about, have you thought about like, incorporating the color contrast enhanced rendering since you already obtained the data of real world lighting and the color map? So it should be possible to re-render the mask to enhance the color fidelity, including that of the shadow. Right? Is it, are, are you talking about like overlaying that kind of mask on the real C3 view or on the virtual object to be rendered in the scene? Could be both because I think the color contrast enhanced rendering has right. been there for a few years. Right, and definitely. You can use different. the compensate color. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely. Maybe in the next session, and the, there is already a paper similar to that concept this year in my I, I believe, and like, uh, like rendering, re-rendering re the virtual, uh, real scene as real as possible and that will be definitely interesting and the capability of this kind of occlusion capable like a softly occlusion capable also would be to modulate this kind of color or or contrast and that will be kind of wonderful too to even like a not just realizing the realistic view but enhancing the c3 view so that people get some benefit out of enhancing their own field of view vision yeah very interesting Sounds cool. So we do have a minor question from the chat. Let me see. I think you briefly mentioned this already. So one of our <laughs> panelists mentioned that, um, how could you evaluate from a perceptual perspective? I think yeah, I did Mark, mention this in the talk. Mark always makes a good and harsh question. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah, I think that's the interesting point. I mean, you know, for, for depths, people have some like a depth measurement qualitative experiment, right? And the shadow, I don't know, the, the easiest way, naive way I can think of is like uh, people just, you know, has to judge which one is real. But I don't know if this judging real is kind of useful for what use cases. So this, this is definitely we should discuss like offline and then maybe we can come up with some new ideas out of it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, good. Uh, another question? Yes, so we have another question in the Q&A session. So Kostas are asking, is asking, would this approach be able to also handle non-predefined real environments? Mm, that's, that's a great question. I mean, it, theoretically, everything is rendered based on known information, right? Geometry, like, yeah. and it's just a matter of you can measure them within the time frame of the real-time application, which means like 60 hertz. That that's that's a, that's definitely like a problem of like three D reconstruction of the scene. I think for geometry, this is kind of capable these days because any like inside out tracking capable wearable headset they they are implicitly measuring the three D geometry. I think the more important thing is the lighting, and there yeah. are many there are papers in in the communities working on this global lighting estimations. But I personally don't know what would be the current trend in real time lighting estimation. So if you guys know, please, please tweet or please put that text on the on the chat. 
Yeah, yeah I think I agree with you. Lighting would be one of the things, like especially when you try to realize the real time update subject to the the variance of global lighting, because like environmental yeah. lighting estimation, which is the key issues for inverse rendering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. mean there are a lot of like, especially recently, I know there are a lot of like, deep learning based methods, but still people are working on it. Right. I wouldn't say that one headset has to handle everything. I think it's more realistic to have some distributed sensors or like static cameras, whatever in the scene incorporated with those headsets in the AR space. That would be more realistic solution for practical applications in the future. Like, a, you know, you have a Wi-Fi and then routers are doing all this mobile thing. Sounds good. Any other questions from the audience? Cool. Oh, if not, so that's saying speaker again. Thank you, Uta. Very nice work. Thank so you. If any of you guys entry. have like further questions, please join us in the post session events. I think Uta will be there to answer your questions mm -hmm. or discuss about further preparations. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, let's move to the next paper. So let me see. So the next paper is entitled uh, Directionally Decomposing Structural Light for Projector Calibration. The authors are Masataki Sugimoto, Daisuke Aiwa, Koki Ishida, Perinaya Pungyong Sona, Kosuke Sato from Asuka Universities. So the speaker will be Daisuke. Yeah, thank you, Ivan. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, the screen is shared correctly? Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so hi, I'm I'm Daisuke Wai, and I'm sorry. I'm in, I'm going to introduce a new projector intrinsic calibration technique that does not suffer from a shallow depth of field problem of a projector. So this work was done mainly by my student, Masatoki Sugimoto and, uh, and my colleagues. So Daisuke Wai and Koki Ishida, Parinya Pumpusanon and Kosuke Sato. So projector intrinsic calibration is essentially the same as a camera calibration method based on a pinhole camera model because the projector and the camera share the same optical mechanism except the light directions. So specifically, we obtain a number of correspondences between 2D projector image coordinates and 3D world coordinates by projecting spatial patterns onto a checkerboard and calibrated the projector using the correspondences. But this method only works as long as the projected pattern appears focused on the board. So normally, projector's aperture is designed to be wide to achieve a bright projection. And therefore, the depth of field is normally very shallow. So when a projection target locates near the projector, we can use a handy calibration bolt and move it easily in front of the projector. So on the other hand, <clears throat> when the target locates far from the projector, we need to prepare a large board to cover the projector's field of view at the target location where the projected pattern is focused. So the calibration board potentially becomes too large to move by a human operator. And in that case, uh, the, the projector intrinsic calibration becomes difficult. So we propose a new projector intrinsic calibration method by directionally decomposing structured light. Our calibration device consists of pinhole array masks and a flatbed scanner. And we project structured light patterns to the device which decomposes the projected light. And our technique virtually converts a projector of arbitrary aperture sizes and focusing distances to a pinhole projector. Then our method does not suffer from the shallow depth of field problem. So here I explain how to decompose the projected light and how to use it for the calibration. So suppose a single pixel emit a light, the light rays emitted from the pixel deflected at the lens and among them only a ray passing through a pinhole, which is the scanner surface. 
So light rays emitted from other pixels also pass through this pinhole. And consequently, these rays form a blob on the scanner surface. And among these rays, we extract the chief ray, uh, which passes through the optical center of the projection lens. So the chief ray can be regarded to be projected from a pinhole projector. And therefore, we can obtain the 2D and 3D correspondences required for the projector calibration. So this is our chief ray extraction technique. So unfortunately, the blob center does not correspond to the chief ray pixel. So, so instead of extracting the chief ray pixel from the blob on the scanner surface, we determine it on the projector's imaging plane. So we found that the blob pixels from a true circle, uh, sorry, the blob pixels form a true circle on the projector's imaging plane and its center corresponds to the chief ray pixel. So please refer to the paper for the details of the proof. So in summary, our calibration process consists of the following three steps. So first, we project structured light patterns from, from a projector to the calibration device. Then we extract the chief ray pixel from each blob on the scanner surface. And finally, we calibrate the projector using the 2D chief ray pixel coordinate on the projector's imaging plane and 3D coordinate of the pinhole through which the chief ray passes and the 3D coordinate of the chief ray pixel on the scanner surface. So we built a prototype using two pinhole array masks as, as shown here. And when we project a fringe pattern, we can see drops on the pattern on the scanner surface. So on the other hand, because the device is placed very close to the projector, the projected fringe pattern is not shown on the mask due to the defocus bra. So this movie shows the scanning of a projected grade code pattern. So you can see the scanning scanner's head is moving and it's uh, fast forward. So you can see the appearance of the fringe pattern on the scanner surface. So I guess it might have been already seen in the movie, the projected pattern was clearly visible in the scanned image when the pinhole array mask was used. So on the other hand, the high frequency components of the pattern was significantly reduced due to the focus blur when the pinhole array mask was not used. So this shows a result of the chief ray pixel extraction. So we compute the chief ray pixel by fitting a circle to the blob on the projector's image plane. So we confirmed that the extracted chief ray pixel was not identical to the blob center in the scanner image. And, and this chief ray pixel actually corresponds to the pixel which emit the chief ray through the, this pinhole. And we, con we conducted a calibration experiment using three types of projectors with three different aperture sizes. So we set two focusing distances, one meter and three meters for each projector. And we compared our method with a conventional projector calibration technique. So in particular, we projected a black and white checker pattern onto a yellow and white checkerboard and captured it using a camera. And the printed yellow and white pattern was used to calibrate the camera and the projected pattern was used to calibrate the projector. And the two patterns were separated using different color channels. And in the near condition, the calibration board was small so that the experimenter could change its pose relative to the projector. And in the fourth condition, the board was too large to move by the experimenter so we moved the projector to change the pose relationship instead of uh, changing the, the pose of the board like this. And this table shows the calibration parameters. 
So let me briefly summarize the result. So first, when the experimenter calibrated one of the projectors, it was too heavy to move in the far condition. So uh, there was no calibrated calibration result obtained. And on the other hand, our method could calibrate it. And this is the second, uh, and second, the focal length and the X coordinate of the principal point were similar between the proposed and conventional methods. But on the other hand, the Y coordinate of the principal point was largely different between the methods. Because in general, this value is not stably, stably calibrated in a projector calibration due to the off-axis property of normal projectors. So nevertheless, the projection error, the projection, reprojection error was were less than one pixel in all cases. So uh, we, we, we confirmed that the calibrated parameters do not seem to be significantly bad. And we evaluated the calibration accuracy in a pose estimation experiment. So specifically, we estimated a projectors pose relative to the large calibration board using the calibrated intrinsic parameters and 2D to, 2D to 3D calibrate, 2D to 3D coordinates correspondences between the projector and the board at the four corners indicated by the red arrows. So we, we computed the, the projector coordinates at the other checker corners and projected white dots at the computed positions. And we measured the distance between the projected dot and the corresponding checker corner. The graphs show the measure, the mean and the standard deviation of the measured distances. And a paired t-test does not show any significant difference for every pair. And thus, we confirmed that the proposed method could calibrate the projector at the comparable accuracy with the conventional method. And we confirmed that the estimated intrinsic parameters realized a relatively large scale dynamic projection mapping application. We estimated the pose of the projector in the world coordinate system with the intrinsic parameters and manually obtained four correspondences between the projector image coordinate and the world coordinates. So in conclusion, we realized projector intrinsic calibration that does not suffer from the shallow depth of field limitation. So our future work uh, would be uh, to speeding up the calibration process using a camera instead of a scanner. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Very nice implementation. So time for questions. Feel free to type in your questions in the Q and A session, or just raise your hands. I think we have like enough time to answer questions. While we are waiting for, maybe I can start with one question. So, I'm curious about: Do you have any insights in terms of like determining the size and the sampling distribution of the pinhole arrays? Because I would expect these factors would affect the crosstalk and accuracy in detecting the centers of those aberrated. Uh, bright spots on the scanner, right? So which will yeah. further affect the derivation of the intrinsic parameters and the poses. So any comments on how to derive an optimal sampling of the pinhole arrays? Yeah, that's a very great question, actually. Um, yeah, that's... Um, so we determined the, the sampling, site, sampling uh, of the, the pinholes, uh, how can I say, try and error process, because if the the, the distance between the pinholes is very too, too short, then the blobs on the scanner uh, overlap. Then it's very difficult yep. to obtain the center of this uh, each blob. But if uh, the, the, the distance becomes longer, then you know, the number of samples becomes small. So it, it's kind of a trade-off. And um, yeah, it's, it's open question. Actually, it's, uh, it, we cannot say uh, this is the optimal and how to set the op set the optimal number is uh, still um, we don't know. But yeah, uh, um, yeah, it's a try and error. And I think um, so. The the current setup actually works very well. So I think um, duplicating the current setup is one of the answer. So um, there's no. Um, Theory to, that's to good. I think that's a good answer, actually. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, this part of things is always the case. Uh, let's see. Okay, so there's a question posting in the chat from Gable. 
asking um, if we understand it correctly, we also need to know the 3D coordinates of each pinhole on the ball with the holes. Is exactly. that correct? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a great question. Yes, um, we need to know the, the the you know the position of the. Oh no, no, no. Um, you know the relative position of each pinhole should be known, but uh, 3D location can be uh, uh, can be calibrated. It, it can be known in the calibration process because it is a kind of normal. Uh, it's same as camera calibration using chance method. Right? You know, you, you move the 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 calibration board in front of the camera, but you don't know the pose of the calibration board in uh, in advance. But you know, in the calibration process, you your method estimates this the, the pose of these boards, so it's same as uh, this method. So we actually estimate the the pose of the pinhole mask as well as the scanner surface in the calibration process. Sounds good. Um, any other questions from the audience? I actually have a small questions. I mean, many projects yeah. right now in the market, I mean, would provide a large range of this kind of auto zooming and auto refocusing, right? So mm -hmm. would these like functionalities affect your calibration? Uh, yeah, that's, um, so, that, so you mean the, you, you, what you want do, to, do you need to, uh, do you need to disable the auto zooming or auto calibration of the projector itself to calibrate your projector to use your method or like is it also like compatible with the, the auto zooming and auto refocusing because the most of projector that already have this kind of like auto zooming capabilities especially mm -hmm. for large field of view right oh yeah uh so even if uh, there is an auto zooming, I think um, intrinsic parameter is not known. I think in, in advance or in the in the yeah. manufacturer side. So in that case, I think we need to calibrate the projector in uh, in that case as, as well. So yeah, I think we can use this method to to calibrate such a projectors. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, if we don't have further questions for this paper, we are going to move to the next paper. Thank you again. And again, if you have further questions to this paper, please come to join us in the post session events. Okay, so the last paper of this session would be multifocal stereoscopy projection mapping from the same group from Osaka University. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's good. Feel free to step in and share your slides. Yeah, I think uh, it's now I'm uh, I'm sharing my slide, right? Oh, cool. Yeah, I can see your slides. Okay, okay good. Okay, thank you, uh, Ivan, again. And uh, yeah, I'd like to introduce our multifocal stereoscopic projection mapping technique uh, from now. <clears throat> Great. Yeah, uh, this work by, was done mainly by my student again, uh, Sorashi Kimura, and my colleagues. So, stereoscopic projection mapping allows a user to see a 3D object floating over a physical surface of an arbitrary shape using a projected imagery. And this technique has been applied for a wide range of fields such as chair conferencing and, and museum guide. Yeah, and yeah, stereoscopic projection mapping is achieved by uh, projecting two images with proper di disparity for each eye in a time sequential manner. So the projected images are observed through active shutter glasses, which prevent interference between the two images for both eyes and provide binocular cues. So on the other hand, uh, current stereoscopic projection mapping is not capable of providing the correct focus cues. So the resultant Vargence accommodation mismatch causes significant discomfort, fatigue, and uh, distorted 3D perception for, uh, for the observer. So there are a bunch of existing solutions for the Vargence accommodation conflict in AR, VR displays. But, but, but to, to, our knowledge, to, to the best of our knowledge, we couldn't find a method that alleviated this problem for the stereoscopic projection mapping so far. So in this paper, we propose to solve the divergence accommodation conflict in stereoscopic projection mapping. So specifically, we solve a unique problem of the stereoscopic projection mapping that is 
display surface is potentially non-uniform or non-planar and moving. So as the center of the solution, we attach electrically focused tunable lenses, ETLs to active shutter glasses to control both versions and accommodation. So we apply fast and periodical focal sweeps to the ETLs. Then the virtual image of every part of the real scene moves back and forth during each sweep period. And we project a target 3D object from a synchronized high-speed projector at the exact moment that the virtual image of the projected imagery on the, on the real surface is located at a desired distance from the ETLs. So from a thin lens equation, we compute the optical power of the ETL by which the virtual image of the projected result locates at the desired depth. So this determines the timing when the image should be projected in a focal sweep period. So we set the frequency of the focal sweep to, the, to be higher than the critical fusion frequency so that the observer perceives the time integral of the scene appearances during the sweep period. And consequently, our technique can provide the correct binocular and focus cues. And actually we project uh, a white illumination or uniform white images onto the, the background surface uh, so that you know uh, through the through the ETLs we can see the, the real scene as um, as these they are located at the, the original location. So the virtual image seen through the ETL is transformed according to the change in its optical power because an observer's eye is not co-located with the ETL but instead please be placed behind it. So uh, this unintended transformation effect is called lens breathing. And previous works applying ETLs to AR and VR headsets faced the same problem and they manually adjusted the displayed image. So on the other hand, we propose a lens breathing compensation technique. So at first, we set the target virtual image from the observer's point of view by which a projection image corresponding to the target is computed. So now we consider this target virtual image from the ETL's point of view. So then the projected image is transformed. So actually we found that this transformation can be formulated as a simple scaling with regard to the optical axis. So we compute the scaling factor from this model and scale the projection image to compensate for the lens breathing artifact. The whole rendering pipeline is as follows. So in this example, we assume to display two bars on a corner surface. And first, we compute perspectively collect images for an observer's eye and simultaneously compute its depth map and the depth map of the projection surface. So now uh, then uh, we divide the rendered image to separately project them at different ETLs of their power. And finally, we apply the lens breathing compensation. And the output images are then projected exactly when the ETLs, up, ETLs optical power becomes the corresponding value. So teams to synchronize the ETLs, active shutter glasses and the projector, we, we measured the delay from the input signals so the ETLs are modulated by the same sinusoidal wave and the projector is, is triggered at the desired optical power of the ETLs. So in our prototype, we project images at three different optical powers. And we open and close the shutter glasses such that the shutter of the right eye becomes open and that of the left eye becomes closed when the ETLs input wave forms the downward curve and vice versa. So we conducted several experiments using a prototype, including a user study to demonstrate the feasibility of the proposed method. So in this experiment, we verified whether the proposed lens breathing compensation improved the artifacts. Uh, we displayed a slanted checker, checker plane on a flat screen and this result shows that our lens breathing compensation technique provided preferable appearance 
with less artifacts than without the, the than without lens breathing compensation. And in this experiment, we we projected three Stanford bunnies on a flat screen, such that the distance of the virtual image of each bunny from the ETR was the same as one of the physical objects like this. And the focus point of the camera was changed from the far to the near of the physical object like this. So please take a look at the right movie. The projected bunny as well as the physical objects appeared focused from the top to the bottom according to the focus point movement. So there are three photos from the movie with different focus points. So we can see that the projected bunnies are focused at different focus points. And we did verified whether the proposed system could provide the correct focus cues when the projection screen is non-planar. The focus point of the camera was fixed at the front projection plane. And the right side of the teapot appeared broad when, the, when observed without using our technique, while our, our while all parts of all parts of the teapot appeared focused when our technique was applied. And we used the uh, we used uh, the the moving surface uh, to verify whether the proposed system could provide the correct focus cues um, to onto such a projection screen. And the Stanford bunny observed without using our technique appeared blurred at certain screen position, while the while the one observed using our technique always appeared focused. And we constructed a prototype system consisting of a pair of liquid crystal shutters, a pair of PTLs, and a synchronized high-speed projector. So the ETL's focal sweep is synchronized with the opening and closing timings of the shutters and the projection timings to achieve multifocal stereoscopic projection mapping. So we conducted a user study to investigate the effect of the variance accommodation conflict on the depth estimation accuracy of a human observer in stereoscopic projection mapping. So in each task, Participants were asked to move the physical pointer by hand until they perceived that it was located at the same depth as the projected virtual target. So this is the virtual target, and this is the physical pointer. So we conducted this depth matching task in two conditions. In the first condition, participants observed the projected virtual target without the focal sweep technique, so we call this condition as conventional. And in the second condition, the proposed technique was applied. And the result showed that the proposed technique could mitigate the vergence accommodation conflict and consequently it significantly reduced the distortions in perceived depths in stereoscopic projection mapping. So in conclusion, we realized the first multifocal stereoscopic projection mapping and confirmed that it worked well for various situations. And the user study demonstrated the significant improvements in the depth perception by the proposed technique. So as a future work, we are interested in maximizing the displayed luminance by optimizing the waveform of the input signal for the, for the ETRs. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you, very nice presentation. And I think this is a very interesting one. Okay, time for questions. Don't be shy, guys. Oh, we do have a question in the channel. So it's from Ken from UCL. So he's asking, have you considered using virtual reflective surfaces as a screen to improve light efficiency and per perceive brightness of the system? Yeah, that's a very great question, actually. So yeah. Um, Yes, of course, uh, if we use um, such a special screen, I think um, the, the visual 
uh, how can I say, visual quality becomes uh, significantly better. I believe that. But uh, yes, and yeah, it is, I think, a very interesting future work for my for our system. But the, the current of our uh, pro, uh, purpose is to, how can I say, display um, a virtual object in uh, arbitrary surfaces around us in a real environment. So in that, uh, how can I say, in this context, um, the applying such a special screen is a little bit, uh, how can I say, the different context, but yeah, it's a very good suggestion. Thank you very much. Sounds good. Um, I'm also curious about, so what's in your mind in terms of like facilitating this projection to more complex real world surfaces? Because you show impressive results on the single planar surface and mm -hmm. this kind of a two-step planar surfaces. So mm -hmm. what if more realistic curved surfaces? What would be the anticipated challenges from your perspective? Thank you for the, the, this very great question. Um, yeah, uh, actually, uh, there is no challenge <laughs> we can do. But, oh yeah, one, one challenge would be, uh, we, so how can I say, to measure the, the, the correct uh, shape of the surface is actually one of the challenge for us, actually. So even if we use, uh, how can I say, depth camera, like connect, connect camera, we cannot uh, get uh, the correct, uh, how can I say, shape of the surface. And uh, actually this method is, is very sensitive to the, the shape of, how can I say, the, the, the accurate shape of the surface. So that's one of the, the challenge. So yeah, exactly, geometry. But uh, the other part, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, how can I say, generating uh, the, the projected image, uh, controlling the ETL, uh, the projection timings, uh, all of these uh, other algorithms are, can be, you know, uh, applied to these kind of services. So, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, one last question on my end. So I could observe some noticeable vignetting effect in results. I would guess mm -hmm. this is, would be mostly due to the use of a focused tunable lens, which is the liquid lens. So yeah. any comments on how to further resolve these issues and improve the image quality? <laughs> ah, that's, a <laughs> that's a very hard question, actually. So yeah, ETL, mm, it's, a, it's a single lens. So we, you know, a single lens system is always uh, suffered by uh, beginning or, you know, um, aberration problems. So yeah. So maybe I like, um, I'm thinking about like just throwing a random saw, like maybe do some like a uh, wavelength calibration first, then incorporate it somehow. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, uh, yeah, I see. Huh. That would be a very yeah. good yeah, suggestion. Yeah, yeah. Just a random saw. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Cam posted oh. another question. So mm -hmm. if you have known the BRDF of a surface, would that mm -hmm. have the rendering pipeline in any means? So basically, if we given given the BRDF, then mm -hmm. I would expect the rendering would be cheaper and more accurate. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's a great uh, suggestion. Yeah, and if uh, yeah, and one. Possibility. So, you know, the surface shape is also uh, uh, can, can be arbitrary, but, you know, surface texture also we, we have to consider about it. So if the surface texture has a different BRDFs, then I think the problem becomes very harder than now. So compensate, uh, you know, texture in terms of light, radiometric compensation, photometric compensation is required. So in that case, we need more computation. <laughs> That's good. So we have a question from the audience posting on the chat window. So Flack is asking, how would this method applied for dynamic content like video at different depths? Uh, so it, video has different depths or? So like the video is dynamic and the video content has different depths. Hmm. That's um, yeah, very uh, yeah. Thank you, before. It's it's a very great question. Actually, we can our technique can uh, apply this kind of uh, this this situation as well. Yeah, no problem. 
Yes, actually, so in, in one of our demonstration, it is very simple, but uh, you know, the teapot is rotating around, rotating this one. So this is video different and with different depths, actually there are different, we render it. Uh, yeah, I can tell that would be the two steps. Yes, yes, two steps. You know, the surface has two steps and uh, the teapot is, you know, ha has a rounded shape. And actually we render this, I think two or three focal planes actually. And, you know, the teapot, actually the, the, the tip of the teapot and uh, the hand, I don't know how can I call it, but you know, the, the grabbing- The handle. Handle of the teapot, actually we render it at different timing. Uh, we project it different timing with different focal lengths. So um, yeah, our technique can apply it. Sounds good. Uh, let's see. Oh, I think we have a question just popping up. Let me see. So he's asking, uh, the transition of the focusing power of the fo focus tunable lens will impact the effect. I think so, right? Yes, yes, of course, yes. Um, yeah, that's uh, actually a very uh, essential point. So this focus tunable lens, as uh, Ivan also asked me about that. So um, yeah, this um, ETL, so we input uh, this signal like this and the input wave is this red line and the output wave, I mean, the, the optical power of the, the, the lens becomes like this, but of course this is um, ideal case. So in actu it's actually, in reality, this, the, 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 the waveform is completely um, not like this. So we have to calibrate this waveform uh, in advance and we, know, we have to know it. And if we input different waves, of course we can use different uh, input waves and uh, different input wave also has uh, different properties, but uh, the, the, because the, the lens consists of a liquid, I mean, this is liquid lens. So the, the high frequency component in the input wave uh, has a little bit, uh, um, how can I say, uh, uh, has an effect on the, the, the output wave and it, 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 it shows a very high frequency, um, how can I say, uh, lipo in the, the output wave. So that's why we use this kind of uh, natural, uh, how can I say, smooth uh, input wave. Yeah, totally understand it. Sounds good. I'm glad that we had a fruitful discussion for this paper and time is up and so that basically concludes our display section so the same all speakers again thank you so much for joining us and also just fyi we have like several other questions like posting in the channels for the other papers that was just presented so please like for all the authors and speakers please move into the gallery town to talk with the authors and also try to answer the questions in the channel and also for the audience, if you have any further questions or comments, please move into the gallery town to talk with authors. Now that this session is on check A, so we have two checks on gallery town. This one is on check A. There will also be social events occurring later in this day. Please join us to share, celebrate, and have fun. So refer to the web pages for details. Again, thank you so much for showing up today. I really appreciate that. Wish you enjoy the conference and have a wonderful day. Cheers. Thank you so much. See ya.